good morning, and thank you very much uh, for this. I see it'll probably be a little battle of the Zs versus the Zs today. So um, you're probably wondering why a government attorney is actually involved in this, and because the USPTO itself is not an uh, operational enforcement agency, of course. We're not customs. Um, but we do have a great deal of influence in developing policy and negotiation positions. We're technical advisors on intellectual property uh, protection and enforcement issues through our undersecretary of director for intellectual property, who's the principal um, advisor to the president and the executive branch in the U.S. on intellectual property issues. So there's a whole group of us in our Office of Policy and International Affairs that work on both domestic and international policy issues. We provide technical assistance to the U.S. trade representative in trade negotiations uh, that runs the gamut from everything from renegotiating NAFTA, uh, having negotiated TPP, um, other types of ongoing constant trade uh, involvement through like uh, trade and investment framework agreements that we have with um, there's a constant drumbeat of things and issues that go forward in the WTO, uh, Trips Council. Uh, we have attaches uh, around the world in 14 places now um, that focus on IP issues as they come up in various different international agencies. We have people based in Geneva that work at the WTO and WIPO, uh, WHO, uh, and uh, also. Uh, to interface and liaison with the EU and other um, uh, European-based organizations like the WCO, like OECD, etc. Um, and we also work very closely with partner uh, organizations and international associations like the ASEAN Secretariat, uh, the GCC, uh, others that um, to provide in partnership with them a variety of range of technical assistance, training, and capacity building programs. So we organize together with other U.S. agencies, often as partners, uh, programs and training for customs officials, for law enforcement, for investigators, for the judiciary, etc., public prosecutors. Um, again, full range of copyright, trademark, trade secret, patent issues, etc., design protection. Um, how this comes up in terms of um, free trade zones uh, is that from a policy perspective, the U.S. government has um, encouraged a greater focus uh, through trade agreements on uh, the management and the oversight on free trade zones, um, the kind of liability that attaches. And it's not just from intellectual property, of course, in any trade agreement are going to be addressed in a variety of manners uh, between the kind of regulation that's involved, the kind of investment opportunities that are involved, uh, rules of origin, etc., transshipment. Um, but as it comes up in the area of intellectual property, one point that we uh, make repeatedly, and I've already addressed that, is that the real world rules apply. Free trade zones are not out of the universe. They're not in a parallel place where the laws don't apply. And there's been this, I think, myth at times, um, or misunderstanding perhaps, maybe it's a willful mis mis misunderstanding in some cases, that somehow the uh, legal authorities can't investigate, can't uh, proceed to take action against uh, bad actors. And that's just simply not true. Now, on paper, it's not true. In some cases, of course, because of other factors, they may be reluctant to take action. They may not want to take action. And they're addressing those uh, uh, sort of uh, motivational uh, hesitancy on their part is uh, often what is addressed in a trade negotiation or tra ongoing relationship, a dialogue context. Um, one thing I'd like to just give a brief overview, um, and I, I noted, you know, statistics are always fun 
numbers sometimes, except when they're not. And in this case, um, the WCO, the World Customs Organization, has 182 members. 112 of those have actually signed the Kyoto Convention. But of those, 112, only 24 members have actually signed on to the Annex on free trade zones. And of those 24, five have actually signed on with reservations on the recommended practices that the WCO has regarding FTZs. And it's interesting to point out where you would think and hope to see leadership by more developed countries that are members of the OECD itself. Out of the OECD membership, only three members have actually signed on to the NX. Korea, Switzerland, and the United States. So from a sort of practical policy perspective, I would say, one thing that we would want to encourage and have been encouraging is that more first OECD members take a leadership role and actually sign on to this annex. They're already WCO members. All OECD members are, in fact, members of the Kyoto Convention, but, but there's this gap or failure just resistance in some cases, to go ahead and do the other step and sign on to the annex. So from a policy perspective, government to government sometimes, it's hard to actually encourage another country to be doing something effectively when they haven't even signed on to the annex to create a legal obligation. So that framework is just, unfortunately, not there with a lot of countries. And so I would certainly Extent that I can encourage anybody in to do to do anything, uh, I would say that INTA should put some effort and direct some of its attention to encouraging when you have dialogues with governments that are OECD members in particular, but WCO members in general, um, to address signing on to the annex that uh, lays out the requirements for managing. Um, you know, I, I probably don't need to tell most of you in this room as to what a, a free trade zone actually is. The revised Kyoto Convention defines it as a part of a territory of a contracting party where any goods introduced are generally regarded insofar as import duties and taxes are concerned as being outside the customs territory. The practical effect is that fenced-in duty-free areas offering warehousing, storage, and distribution facilities for trade Transshipment and re-export that comes from the World Bank, uh, which has done a number of studies also on uh, FTZs. Uh, these numbers are all from the OECD study that was done, uh, published in just late last year, in 2017. If you haven't read it, it makes good bedtime uh, airplane reading. Um, if you're feeling particularly bored and not watching the movies. Um, it, but it gives a lot of statistics. It, it provides, I think, a wealth of information, not only about the current status of uh, different types of free trade zones that exist, but also where they are, what's happening with them, and what's the actual effect on economic growth, trade, and also the interesting statistics that deal with the trade in illicit uh, goods and counter. Um, there's benefits. Uh, I think all of us recognize the benefits of those. Uh, there's savings, there's duty free imports, flexible customs procedures, rules, um, assembly and repacking of semi finished goods. Obviously, this is a great concern to many rights holders um, because the, the parts themselves, components may be coming in uh, that are not branded and they get branded while in the FTC and then shipped back out. Uh, there are vulnerabilities. Uh, there's limited regulatory oversight. 
There's reduced levels of inspections and customs and supervision in many cases. And that's certainly true where they're, they haven't even signed on to the kinds of uh, restrictions and procedures that the WCO recommends. And uh, in many cases, a lack of clear government regulations that apply in those circumstances. I can recall having discussions with government officials in the context of negotiations over FTCs. Uh, and some of them would actually sit there and say, we don't have any control. And we would say, well, wait a minute. Put counterfeits aside for a second. Someone ships in some sort of product that conceivably has a potential disease or health concern. Would you take an interest in the FTZ then? And they would say, mm, well, sure, of course. Health laws still apply. And say, well, okay, so if they're shipping in some sort of devices that could be used for, shall we say, building bombs, would that cause you any concern? Oh, and they would say, well, of course. We could look into that. We could investigate that. We would regulate that. We would deal with that. But when it comes to intellectual property, somehow they just don't feel it's part of the same universe of regulation. And that's, I think, um, part of the uh, uh, sort of educational process that they need to do themselves. But they need to also recognize that the laws are not exempt. Um, the problem we're really facing is that in many cases, not all, there are a number of FTZs uh, that operate very legitimately, very above board, and there are not reported incidents. Uh, but they can act as a safe harbor for bad actors. Uh, the production of counterfeit goods, the application of counterfeit marks in particular, uh, from imported labels, of the repacking, as I said, uh, the distribution, in some cases, uh, of counterfeit goods, and the sanitizing, if you will, of shipments uh, to disguise the origin via transshipment. Um, from, I guess, my work, at least in observations from a policy perspective over the last 20-some years at the USPTO, it's that last bullet that is one of the most serious ones. It's the transshipment of things that come in, and then something happens, and then it goes back out again. And in some cases, the regulatory authorities or the uh, other authorities or law enforcement authorities, it, it's like an FTC is a black box. Things go in, something happens, comes out. No idea. Okay? And in many cases, they don't want to know. They don't really exercise any curiosity in what's going on in there. And it's like, well, that's up to somebody else. In many cases, of course, uh, FTZs are actually operated and managed by perhaps a government corporation, perhaps it's contracted out to a private sector type of company that runs it. Uh, you know, actually, the number of FTZs internationally that are literally run and managed by state agencies themselves is actually a minority. Most of this is contracted out, if you will, for the management of it. And so law enforcement officials in many cases don't feel like they can get involved. Or that it's, in some cases, it's already, it's being taken care of by somebody else. You know, it's a lot of finger pointing goes on in terms of the of assumption of responsibility. Um, and that's a typical path. Okay. Stuff comes in, goes through, goes to a bonded warehouse, it exports to the FTZ warehouse, then it goes through some sort of customs procedure, and then it goes into another container. Or it goes, hopefully not, into the domestic market for, or is further distributed in some places. Al, but, uh, as I'll uh, talk about his experiences, I guess, with uh, a certain port in his backyard um, about what happens in many cases with product that isn't supposed to leak out, but does. Um, 
pipe already sort of mentioned, there is a direct correlation that's been found between FTCs and fake exports. The more there are, uh, the more there is. I mean, it's, that's, it's kind of that simple. You don't have to be a brilliant statistician to see the numbers, actually. Uh, the more FTCs there are, the common misconception that somehow, you know, the rules don't apply. Well, they do, and they should. Uh, uh, there are tools internationally, as I mentioned. Uh, the WCO Revised Kyoto Convention is there. It addresses it. There's a full annex about FTCs and recommended procedures that should be put into place, the kind of restrictions, the kind of regulation that should be there. It's up to countries to join that and sign it, and then implement it. Um, free trade agreements can also, and usually, at least from the U.S. perspective, I, can, I won't speak to other countries uh, that enter into uh, FTAs as to this, how much attention um, they focus on FTCs and their trade agreements, but U.S. free trade agreements clearly have a lot of attention on this. Uh, and it's been something that we have I can sort of say, unfortunately, not always with the greatest clarity. Uh, it's a trade agreement negotiation. Sometimes there's a bit of a compromise there. Uh, depends how resistant a certain trading partner is to having clear obligations laid out in the trade agreement. But that said, um, FTAs do certainly provide a good policy opportunity and vehicle for addressing uh, between trading partners at the government level. Um, I mentioned the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement. Nobody's probably talked about ACTA in a long time. It's kind of like a little blast from the past. Everyone thought it would be successful until the EU Parliament voted it down, and that pretty much killed it. But ACTA did address free trade zones. Uh, there was a provision in there, and it was significant to the extent that if you look back at least at the proposed uh, act language, uh, it was significant that one, it was in there and there was as much about it in there as there was. Unfortunately, the act did not come to pass. Um, and that, uh, that incarnation, maybe in the future ones. Uh, the intermodal law guidelines um, have uh, addressed it, and I think as I pointed out, you're doing that or that or going forward uh, further. And then also the WCO standards to secure and facilitate global trade. Uh, that's a safe framework that also addresses uh, FTC. So there is a lot of international framework, legal language that's been hammered out um, by countries and parties over the years. It's there if countries want to use it. Um, and part of what uh, governments do and my office does, is uh, find opportunities to keep promoting that adoption and uh, implementation of those kinds of framework agreements and regulations. Um, I, I, don't, I won't go into specifics, I don't think we have enough time for that, uh, but there are specific Annex D, Chapter 2, that offers 17 standards and four recommended practices. So again, if you want a little bit of uh, entertaining bedtime reading, you can just quickly read those through, but these are the standards and the practices that at least WCO members have agreed that are important and should be addressed and, again, are there as a framework, a checklist, if you will, for what countries should be doing. Uh, getting them to do it is another whole game, of course, but there's guidance. There is, there is a roadmap. I won't go through free trade, but I will, I'll mention one in particular. Uh, the um, Korean US FTA, uh, which is the most recent sort of uh, comprehensive FTA that the US has negotiated. Uh, the provision there is that each party shall provide that its competent authorities may initiate border measures ex officio with respect to imported, exported, or in transit, or merchandise in free trade zones. So it's explicit. The obligations there. 
again, it's uh, general obligatory uh, language, um, and the proof is always in the implementing regulations or the procedures that are hammered out to implement, but um, there at least is a hook, if you will, uh, for that to be a point of obligation between trading partners. Um, uh, labor you with act. I spent too many years on act, and that's why I just hadn't mentioned it. Uh, the model guidelines for INTA, um, unrestricted regimes for transshipment and transit of goods through FTZs significantly contributes to the development and extension of the scale, et cetera. That's the model free trade agreement. And then within that, there's a provision that recommends uh, recommendations on measures to halt the transshipment and transit of counterfeit goods in free trade zones and free sports. Um, I know we decided not to go into a lot of discussion about liability per se, uh, but I have to say that I'm disappointed with a recent case from last November. Uh, Singapore High Court, uh, in a case involving Brock by Louis Vuitton and others, um, against Megastar Shipping, uh, attempted to establish, under Singaporean law, a liability for the shipper, uh, uh, both coming in and going out. Uh, and in this case, it was Megastar coming in and going out. So it wasn't just a random uh, shipping line. Um, Unfortunately, uh, on the one hand, the court recognized that what was involved was, in fact, counterfeit. It was trademark infringement. There was no question about that in the court's mind. Unfortunately, the court then found that it, under Singapore law, it didn't constitute importation and it didn't constitute exportation. So, therefore, no liability. Well, that's kind of the whole point. You bring something in to a freight trade zone, you're transshipping it, and it's going back out. This was not intended and did not go into the domestic market of Singapore. It was coming from China through Singapore to Batam, Indonesia. And everyone conceded, yes, it's infringing. It's counterfeit goods. What a shame. But unfortunately, the court wouldn't uh, attach liability. <clears throat> it's on appeal. So we'll see the, the final word has not yet uh, been uh, given by uh, the Singapore Court of Appeal. Uh, keep your fingers crossed, I guess. Uh, that would actually, I think, be a significant decision to be able to be cited. Obviously, it would be very significant because a fair amount of trade goes through Singapore. Great decision to establish the type of liability on that uh, intermediary, in this case, shipping. Uh, can I say something? Of course, please. With or without microphone? Uh, well, I can hear you, but maybe you should use the microphone. Maybe, yeah, because we're everybody. I believe it's important because what you just said is a gross. Thank you. Make sure that the entire audience can hear you. Okay, yeah, yeah. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. I have to add something because uh, I was involved in the Megastar case from the very beginning. And what you just said was, a, I, I perceive as a gross, a gross misinterpretation of what is going on. Okay. There's no doubt about the shipper being liable for an injunction. Right? But the case turns around, is the shipper liable for damages as a trademark infringement? There's a big difference. So, in that case, the, the megastar had no doubt whatsoever that this counterfeit good should not pass Singapore. But what the plaintiff wanted is, in addition to this uh, cooperation for clamping down and destroying the counterfeit goods, they wanted full damages. And the full damages would be something in the millions, right? Well, the, the freight forwarder megastar only earns about $50 for receiving a container, even without knowing what is in the container. The Bill of Laden said, household goods, right? Megastar didn't even touch the container because it was seized before it could reach the premises of Megastar. And then he should be liable for damages. 
So the whole case in Singapore is not about whether uh, uh, Fred Forwarder is a, an intermediary in the European sense, so he must contribute towards all the officials handling these counterfeit goods. It's more about can we treat him as a normal infringer who would willfully interact with the manufacturer to spread these counterfeit goods in the world. And what you have just said was something, oh, Singapore is a place they contribute to uh, counterfeiting and transshipment, which is not true at all. And I find this important to emphasize that you are entirely wrong when you say such things about the ongoing case. Well, uh, thank you for that yeah. observation. And um, I think if I need to correct my remarks, it's that uh, the point of the Singapore case that I think is the most troubling in terms of precedent is that in finding, and, and the court did acknowledge that this is very fact-based, intensive types of analysis that has to go on, uh, but it found that that type of uh, activity did not constitute importation and did not constitute exportation. Nonsense. But no, that's, that's in the court decision. No, the... Let's, let's, let's no. keep the debate for uh, the time Basil has finished. Uh, I observe that you do not entirely agree to Peter's observation, but please carry on, Peter. Okay. Um, Sorry. But I think uh, it's the first, it's one, uh, not the first, but it's a, a recent case that um, is worth looking at and looking at the analysis that the court made in it, which I think has, it's instructive to all sides in this discussion, to be honest. Um, the WCO SAFE framework, uh, the Authorized Economic Operator Program, is something that you should be at least aware of. It attempts to harmonize the advanced electronic cargo information that customers need. It's a consistent approach to use the advanced information to identify high-risk consignments, outbound inspection of high-risk consignments being exported, and gives accredited operators preferential customers processing. Um, so those are, those are some of the international frameworks uh, that can be used. They're policy-based, uh, and they can constitute an obligation to implement them when a country does sign on to them and agrees to adopt them. Uh, so from a government perspective, what can we do uh, to address issues about intermediaries and the broader issue of FTZs? Um, I would say it's usually in the government-to-government -government or multilateral context of trade agreements, trade discussions, and policy discussions uh, to facilitate uh, trade. So with that, I'll um, Peter, thank you very much for um, giving your perspective of uh, dealing with FTEZs, I now say. Um, and um, 